Perfect. Okay, we're going to get started because um, I don't want to lose time for the presenters. So thank you very much for those who are here and managed to get away from coffee to come here with us. And thank you for everyone who's online. Uh, it's a tough day for everyone. It's been a long week, a lot of conversations going on. And uh, so we really appreciate that. Um, today is going to be about use of immunization data and triangulation of this information. Um, for those who were not acquainted with the diagram that we've been recycling for a while, especially me, um, <laughs> we have a pretty big immunization toolkit nowadays that ranges and touches quite a lot of components and components that can be triangulated among them, of course. But in particular, I wanted to highlight the bottom right corner, um, especially because uh, this is a collaboration that we've had with different partners among Gavi, among CDC and such. So um, we have taken also the opportunity to uh, present a little bit more these triangulation dashboards. And we are having also some experiences from the field of, uh, of triangulation activities. But most importantly as well, I think that even before we get to triangulation, it's very important that we talk about uptake of this data. So uh, how to use this data and how to make sure that people use this data. Because if you don't start with even checking your baselines, there's no point to triangulate things that you don't even know if they're right or not. So for this reason, we're going to have Patrick Omeo from his Uganda, who is going to present us the work that they have done with the MOH and the, and the EPI team in, uh, in country to start uptaking and revamping a bit the EPI dashboards in order to make sure that um, the use gets increased so that they can move forward with their triangulation activities. So, yep, give it up for Patrick. All right. Oh, good morning. Uh, Patrick Miel uh, is my name. I work with HISP Uganda, but I also support the package development team. So remotely, we've been working with the, the global team uh, in supporting the development. So a lot of contribution has been coming from our team to the global team. Yeah, so, so what I would want to share is really um, what we're trying to call a participatory approach to uh, adapting these uh, packages for uh, the immunization. Uh, for Uganda, so and uh, we so we've made some progress, and that's really what we want to share with you. So I'm here really on behalf of a team, uh, Stephen, uh, uh, Sam Kasozi, and Prosper, whom we've been working with closely, and of course the Ministry of uh, Health and especially uh, the program team from uh, uh, the, the 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 UNEPI. That is the Uni um, Uganda. National Expanded uh, Program for Immunization. So, uh, so we, we, our journey starts way back uh, in 2018 uh, when we started supporting uh, the package implementation, uh, and it was just more than uh, uh, for, for for EPI. We were doing for TB, HIV, and malaria, and the initial start was really focusing on aggregate. Uh, and so, the, the scope of work we had was really to to do the installation and do capacity uh, building, training, and then also infrastructure support because we had a lot of capacity issues on the server. But in there, we found ourselves doing <laughs> a more general support for DHIS too, because we couldn't just focus on, uh, on these other three. So, and, and so when we went in, we found uh, the, the minister at the time was revising the HMIS. So we had to go through the whole process of revising the HMIS. But that was also good because uh, it gave us an opportunity to to bring in some of the things that we felt were lacking within the HMIS, especially for the EPI program. So we went through that from 2018. Uh, and uh, it, of course, what we did was to be able to install the, the packages on the, uh, on the national instance. And, and that's what you see, the sample that I'm showing you up there. That is the, the version that we had. Uh, but still, we, we still when, when we still go to the district, you still see their dashboard. This is their handmade dashboards, you know? Uh, if you go to the district, you will see they still have this kind of dashboard at the district, and uh, the, the others at the health facilities, which are really still handmade, and, and you wonder why they cannot really go into DHIS2. Uh, and so along the way, we realize that, of course, there are challenges of access, 
Yeah, most people have challenges of accessing dashboards within the HIS2. Uh, and that, of course, limits their use, especially the, the senior people, the program uh, uh, managers and, and all the senior people find it a bit difficult to access uh, the dashboard for some reason. My password is not there and stuff like that. We also realize that there's little appreciation or awareness of uh, the DHIS2 analytics. Uh, people think DHIS2 is just to collect data. If you talk about dashboards, not so much. They feel like DHIS2 is just for you to be able to, to report. And also for the immunization, the way we, we had designed the dashboard, we had uh, both the analysis app and then the dashboard. So when you're training people and explaining to them the two, it was a bit uh, uh, confusing. And so along the way, we still saw a lot of ad hoc requests. Whenever they want to do analysis, they keep asking, provide this and the other. Uh, and of course, also we realize there are still many tools. We have many dashboards in Uganda that are out there that really uh, create a lot of confusion sometimes. And so we thought, uh, how can we try to improve what we have within the, 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 uh, uh, the, the immunization package and try and improve on the, the, the dashboard. And so with the, with the global team, we say, let's try and have a more participatory approach to doing this. So, so basically with this, we would uh, then try to also bring in the new analytics because uh, the, the, the analytics within the HIS has improved. There are things that we had to create an app for uh, like if you talk of um, uh, the scatter plots to do the, uh, the then the monitoring chart and all these things, these things are now within the DHIS. So we said, can we use this opportunity to uh, look at what we have within the package and then be able to use the latest features of DHIS to and improve this dashboard? Yeah, and along the way, of course, support integration and then look forward to triangulation of data. And then we generate this feedback and improve the general uh, package of uh, uh, the general, the global package for the EPI. And so we started that, and that's one of the workshops that we had in Uganda. We had someone, uh, the team from uh, the, the global team uh, implementers come in. One was in the meeting, a man was right behind there. Uh, and so, so with this, basically, we are trying to see if we get the, the, the package, we get it um, into the instance, and then jointly review with the team, get their feedback. But the most critical one is really to go in depth with the indicator, uh, the understanding of the indicators, because once they understand the indicators, sometimes you take it for granted, people know dropout rates. They don't understand sometimes. But when you sit with them and explain to them, tell them this is our numerator, this is our denominator, this is how we are estimating the denominator, of course, most of them are estimated. Then they start to appreciate uh, the, the whole process. And then once we get that, we then quickly do some refinement of, uh, of, of the analytic outputs. Small things like color legends. Some people don't like certain colors. Like if you look at uh, <laughs> these colors, they didn't like it, you know? But that's what we had in our package, you know? Yeah, they, they didn't like that color. So they have to make choices of their color that makes them happy, you know? So, and then we rapidly do that refinement. And then we think after we've done that, we should be able to then go ahead, deploy, and then train, and then of course, generate some feedback uh, to the global team and be able to to generally improve on the package. So that's really the process that we want to follow. Uh, and right now we are the, the rapid refinement and improvement. We have something that we are going to show you, just a screenshot. And so, uh, so with the team that came in, we were able to go to the field. That was again, uh, uh, Manuel going out to the health facility to talk to the team and see what's there. Uh, there was trying to present to them the, 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 on the package, you know, to, for them to understand uh, what it is. And so uh, with the lessons that we've so far learned, because really there's still a lot that we need to learn because we're trying this out. Uh, we, we are seeing a lot, a lot of participation. I can tell you when we are reviewing the indicators, everyone was a subject matter expert. They, they had something to say, you know, about the indicators, you know, and that was quite interesting because it was, they, they had something to say about the indicators. Uh, we, we've seen a lot of the, the, the whole thing of getting their perspective early into the development of these packages, because if we just take it to them without getting their early perspective, I think that can also be a problem. And we think this will promote, of course, uh, use and ownership of this product, because at the end of the day, they know what, how it has come about. And it will also validate our interpretation of requirements. Uh, there are requirements that we, we, we go into the guidelines of WHO, and then we read and we sit in Oslo and we, you know, we have an understanding of requirements and we develop this and we send it down there. But 
when you try to bring it out to them, they may not, it may not be real what they know. And one case here is, uh, you see up there, we have that the handmade uh, monitoring chart that they are doing. And for them, they're using cumulative uh, dropout rates. Uh, in what you have, oh, it's not cumulative. So you, you, you realize that there's a bit of a, a disconnect on what they know or how they're doing it and how the guidelines are, are bring it out. So we've had to make some adjustments to try and uh, meet what they would want. Uh, so, uh, and then this whole field experience, uh, if you see those pile of boxes, that's at a district level. So it also gives people understanding of like, well, this data that we get into DHIS, how, how does it get there, you know? So that is the HMIS room at a district level where data is entered. So all those piles of data is data that comes from the HMIS, from health facilities, and they, keep, they enter them into the HHS and they file them. So you can imagine that whole pile. So it gives that whole appreciation of, uh, for implementers to understand the processes that uh, people go through to get uh, this data into the HHS too. And that gives you an understanding on, uh, as you're making the designs and all these things to be able to, to, to appreciate how things come in. So some of the, well, so this is now the beautiful sum. You can see that uh, the colors are, you know, they are nice, you know? I, I believe you can feel it, you know? As <laughs> coming from that up eh, to, to something that, this is more appealing. Even if you feel like, yes, it makes a lot of sense. You have very nice pivot tables that can quickly, yeah. And you can quickly look at your district or whatever, see which one is red, yellow. You know, those are the colors that our people kind of understand. And when you're in red, you're in trouble. <laughs> Yeah, that is the BCG. Uh, again, this is sample. I wouldn't want to. Yeah, but yeah, the dropout of BCG MR1 is quite high. Yeah, yeah. So, but this gives you. Uh, yeah. So, so, so the challenges that we are facing. One, one big one, of course, is the, the picture limitations, which we are being really trying to engage the uh, uh, the product uh, managers. One of them is this open access of the dashboard. People, people don't like logging in. If you talk of a dashboard, the dashboard should be where I go, key in my URL and I see what I see and I get out. So we really have to try and see how we, we advocate for this. Uh, there was this thing of cumulative dropout rates that we are still trying to see how do we implement that? Because that's still what they want, cumulative dropout rate. They want, if I'm in January, that is okay. But if I'm like March, I add January, February, then that's my total dropout and then I, so it's cumulative. We are still struggling with that a bit. And then they have these things of ranking and uh, counting organization based on performance. I want to know my top five districts, you know, uh, and, and be able to count some of those. Those are some of the things that we find a bit challenging. Of course, we have to do triangulation. We realize some of the VPD data is not integrated. So that's something that we need to work on. And of course, the, the, the costs around training, because once we are done, we need to train people. Yeah, so we, we don't have that budget right now. Uh, and right now, also the issues of version. This is, the, this is version uh, 2.37. That's where you can do interesting stuff uh, with uh, some of these, uh, some of those uh, single values and with the percent you can do with the latest version. The version in the production is a bit uh, old, but of course we are working in the ministry in the next uh, few weeks to, to do the upgrade so that uh, we have all this in the production instance. So looking ahead, of course, we have to finalize uh, that development. Uh, we need to finalize and deploy. We need to support the integration. Uh, we need to do the training and we need to keep pushing the product team to prioritize some of these missing features in the system. I mean, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the software. And then we need to reevaluate uh, uh, the, the use because the idea we want to make sure that people are using this and then be able to generate uh, requirements that uh, will improve on the, the global uh, uh, package. So thank, thank you. And just to acknowledge the people that we work with. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, you've been very quick, actually. I, I think I like SKG a bit too much. Um, uh, <laughs> um, now, just like a quick introduction, we're going to have like a pretty much uh, a whole block session managed 
by, by Angela and Joel, um, because all the countries that we're going to present are all somehow affiliated with CDC and they're working also with CDC to, uh, on, the, on their triangulation. So we are going to have uh, Angela Montesanti Porter, um, who is gonna introduce us a little bit to the triangulation dashboard that I have been working on. And then we're going to have Dr. Kulibali uh, from Ivory Coast, who is going to describe a little bit their experience with their triangulation efforts. And um, then it's going to be online, a colleague from, uh, from Nigeria, uh, Bitami Adeoria. And um, again, field uh, experiences are the key to kind of feedback into the, the global packages. So we really want to give the opportunity to, feel, to the field to give their, their, their perspective and their challenges. And then finally, Joe is going to present for the Ethiopian colleagues who unfortunately are having some connectivity troubles. So at least we're not lacking the opportunity to show as well um, their experiences. So thank you very much and I'll leave it to you, Angela. Thank you, Vittoria. So my presentation is actually gonna be split. I'm gonna give um, sort of a brief introduction and get us all on the same page with a common sort of global triangulation framework for immunization programs. Um, and then we'll actually hear the use cases from the countries Victoria, Victoria just mentioned. Um, and then I'll come back and end with um, some information on the triangulation dashboard prototypes that we've been developing within DHIS2. Um, so with that, the objectives of the remainder of the session are really to gain an understanding of triangulation key concepts, particularly in the world of immunizations. Um, learn how to implement uh, the four-step triangulation process that's been outlined in the global guidance developed by WHO, UNICEF, and CDC. Um, and then review national and subnational examples of triangulation through our country use cases. And finally, discuss ways in which dashboards can be used to integrate triangulation into program. So let's start with the basics. What is data triangulation? Um, well, the global working group that developed the triangulation guidance had to first come up with an agreed upon definition, which was a lot harder than it's going to sound when I tell you what definition we came up with. Um, but it's the synthesis of existing data from two or more sources to address relevant questions for program planning and decision making. So really what we're talking about here is even in the absence of perfect data, public health practice has long recognized that combining many pieces of weaker evidence can form a strong basis for improved decision making. And notice we're not saying perfect decision making, right? Um, and then also just to mention that the strategic, strategic advisory group of experts on immunization or the SAGE data working group also came out with a statement and publication um, really focusing on, on how data triangulation should really be the default for public health analyses as a means to use all existing program data. So again, really getting at that data use um, that's kind of fit for purpose. So some common triangulation principles here. Um, your triangulation analyses and exercises should really be driven by important program objectives. So you really wanna think about fit for purpose here. Um, you wanna use existing data. So ideally no new data need to be collected. You wanna include diverse data sets. So for example, coverage, stock and surveillance. Um, and we saw Uganda really trying to address some of this in their presentation. Um, engage a multidisciplinary team if possible. Really, we want, with the triangulation guidance, we really wanted to focus on basic analyses that include local knowledge and the interpretation. So while there's always a time and place for sort of complex modeling or, or statistics, um, we really want to make sure that data analysis and data use can really be um, accepted and used at even the very local or basic level. Because um, as again, Patrick mentioned, you know, some people don't even really know what a dropout rate is or how to calculate it. So we really want to try and keep things as simple as possible for them to be able to use their data for their purposes. And finally, the results should be communicated for use and improved decision making. So we're not doing analyses just for the sake of having analyses. So what are the benefits of triangulation? Well, it encourages collaboration across program units. This really allows for greater data sharing and access. It aids a deeper understanding of data through synthesis. And again, incorporating that contextual information, local context, as well as considerations of data limitations. Um, because all data sources are gonna have their limitations, but that doesn't mean that you can't use that data. 
It also identifies areas for program improvement that not, might not be apparent from an individual data source. It improves confidence and conclusions and quality of recommendations for planning and policy or st uh, strategic decision making. And also builds a health workforce capacity around critical thinking, data analysis, and data use. So I won't spend too much time on this, but I just want to mention again that there is some draft global guidance available, um, and it's available here at this website. The slides will be available um, on the scheduler. Um, but essentially what we have here um, is a package of guidance documents that are meant for two levels. So they're meant for the national immunization program staff as well as subnational immunization program staff. Um, and within those two levels, there's four documents. So there's a general triangulation overview document, as well as three topic specific annexes. Um, we surveyed you know, global, regional, and country level staff and really asked, okay, what, what kind of questions, what kind of program issues are you really wanting to address with triangulation? Um, and pretty consistently, we heard these three topics, so immunity gaps, program performance, and program targets and denominators. Um, so I encourage you, we don't have time today, but um, there's a lot of detailed information here uh, with particular indicators, uh, examples from countries and subnational level, and how they've been able to conduct triangulation analyses around these, um, these specific topics. Um, and not to oversimplify things, but the guidance really kind of revolved around what we created as a four-step triangulation process. So first, starting with asking the key question, what programmatic issue, what programmatic question are you really trying to answer or assess with your triangulation exercise? Step two, identify existing data sources. Step three, summarize the data and the local context. And step four, develop an action plan. So there's lots of opportunities here to integrate triangulation into existing activities. What we're really trying to prevent here is adding additional workload to staff that are already quite overburdened. What we hope here is that staff can start using triangulation analyses as part of their regular activities and part of their work to become more efficient and effective with their data use. So for example, they can, uh, in their routine analysis, so feedback on reported data, um, their uh, EPI data review meetings that usually occur at monthly or quarterly level, depending on, on which administrative level you work with, um, annual desk reviews, um, ad hoc evaluations of intervention impact or program implementation. So for example, uh, new vaccine introduction evaluations, um, outbreak investigations, uh, part of data quality reviews or EPI and surveillance reviews, um, existing trainings, so thinking of trainings of mid-level managers and supportive supervision, and then finally, of course, dashboard design. Um, and we'll come back to that final piece, particularly in regards to um, DHIS2 dashboards, as soon as we hear from our country's cases, um, starting with uh, Dr. Ruth Kribali from Cote d'Ivoire. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Good morning. I am Dr. Ruth Koulibaly. I work in Cote d'Ivoire Immunization Program. I will present how we are used that DHS2 and data triangulation to improve information system performance and strengthen data use at all levels of the Cote d'Ivoire immunization program. This is the outline that I will follow. Until, nine, until 2021, multiple information systems were used to manage Cote d'Ivoire immunization program data, such as EDVDMT for vaccine coverage, VPD surveillance vaccine, vaccine stock data, APINFO for vaccine coverage, VPD surveillance data, and stock management tool vaccine stock data. 
multiplicity of tool and data source for each data type result in weekly that data use for program planning that we that was revealed in 2019 data quality assessment okay the objectives of Cote d'Ivoire ministry is are to improve the performance of Cote d'Ivoire information system for support expanded program on immunization data and strengthen capacities of Cote d'Ivoire immunization and VPD surveillance staff at all levels in data management, analysis, interpretation, and use for decision making. In terms for method, we are migrated in DHS2 for the management of vaccine coverage, VPD surveillance, and vaccine stock data. We implemented a pilot based in WHO, UNICEF, and US CDC guidance and triang on triangulation for improved decision making in immunization program. At the subnational level, we conducted two triangulation trainings where held for regional and district level immunization and VPD surveillance data manager. In terms of results related to migration in DHS2, we conducted data harmonization to incorporate historical data in DHS2. We conducted trainings of immunization and VPD surveillance staff of all levels. The DHS2 data package rolled, rolled out in Cote d'Ivoire are WHO API, WHO integrated disease surveillance and response aggregate. The DHS2 data package finding WHO VPD case-based surveillance tracker. Since February 2022, DHS2 use, use at national level. In terms of results related to the pilot triangulation guidance at national level, we received strong support from API leadership. The priority question was can exercise data support Cote d'Ivoire to document progress toward measures elimination. We conducted the four step triangulation process. We identified data quality issues and population and geographic areas with immunity gap. The findings helped inform decision on introducing measles vaccine second dose in Cote d'Ivoire and revisiting target population estimate. We conducting, we conducting two series of trainings. The, the training was conducted for presentation, individual and group work. We received technical and financial support from US and Cote d'Ivoire CDC office. Here are two photos of the Cote d'Ivoire immunization triangulation. In conclusion, with DHS2, Cote d'Ivoire immunization and VPD surveillance staff are better equipped to conduct monitoring data analysis and triangulation to inform program planning at all levels. The national immunization program staff has provided triangulation activities using DHS2 during training and supervision. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.
Hello, good day, everybody. Can someone confirm they can hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, okay, very well. All right, good, good day, everybody. My name is Peter Miyade, and I work with the African Field Epidemiology Network, uh, Nigeria Country Office. Uh, this morning, on behalf of other team members, um, including colleagues at the AFNET office and US Centers for uh, Disease Control and Prevention, I'll be making this presentation on our ongoing work on the integration of DHIS2 and external information systems for triangulating and visualizing routine immunization and uh, vaccine preventable disease surveillance data in Nigeria. I'll be speaking uh, along this outline. By way of background, uh, currently in Nigeria, uh, the District Health Information System houses the routine immunization and other uh, routine health case based and aggregate data. And uh, most instances of DHIS2 in Nigeria is managed and maintained by the Federal Ministry of Health and the National Primary Care Development Agency. One of the uh, surveillance systems implemented in Nigeria is the SOMA system, Surveillance Outbreak Response Management and Analysis System, which houses case-based disease surveillance data and is currently managed by the Nigeria Centers for uh, Disease Control. What are the triangulation uh, challenges in Nigeria? There are limited opportunity to triangulate for program improvement. And this is because of weak data use due to fragmented access into the system and lack of sharing and coordination across the currently existing system. So this morning, I'll be presenting the processes of collating, um, analyzing, visualizing vaccine preventable disease surveillance and routine immunization data into a triangulation dashboard that is used for uh, improved programmatic decision making. And I'd like to also state that the intended users of the dashboard are across the national and the subnational levels. At the national level, we intend the dashboard to be used by EPI and data officers, and also at the um, state and district level. Just like Angela mentioned during our opening presentation, we're not just uh, merely bringing data together just for the sake of analysis. Uh, it's important for us to be guided and have a direction and a core reason for why uh, we're doing triangulation. So I'm going to just share with you now the areas, identify program um, issues and the key questions we are hoping the, the triangulation we're doing would answer. The first of that area is unidentified immunity gap. So we wanted to know does admin, administrative coverage appear to be accurate in Nigeria? The surveillance data suggests that the immunization gaps. The second area is to assess program performance and data quality. And these are the questions we are currently asking using the data available within the system. Which states or districts are with the lowest performance or inconsistencies in data quality that also requires follow-up? So these are the triangulation questions across the program um, areas where issues are being identified. Just uh, before we started the whole of work around triangulation, it was important for us to be able to um, understand the reliability of the different data sources that we'll be making use of. Uh, listed there on the screen are the different sources where we're putting data and doing um, uh, triangulation analysis. So first of all, you see the administ administrative vaccination coverage, and it was important for us to understand the strengths and the limitation of the administrative vaccination coverage. Under the strength, we see that you know, the administrative coverage is available on a monthly basis and it is available across the different levels. But that also comes with this limitation because data quality issues like outliers are discrepancy as some of the issues with the um, administrative vaccination coverage in Nigeria. Talking about vaccination coverage survey, although by way of strength, they are more reliable than the administrative coverage, but we all know that surveys are infrequent. So, also on this table are the different strengths and limitations of other sources like the WUNIC survey, uh, like the WUNIC estimate, that's the WHO and UNICEF estimate for immunization coverage, uh, measles case-based surveillance data and the measles aggregate surveillance data, which is available on THI soon. For the sake of time, I will not be able to go through all the strengths and limitations. All right, uh, I'll talk a bit around the method or approaches that were adopted to uh, 
collate data and do analysis and visualize that on the dashboard. It was important for us to start with system mapping uh, because we're pulling data across platform, DHS2, SOMAS, and other system. Uh, so it was important for us to understand the existing metadata on DHS2 and that of the SOMAS. So we conducted a systematic review and took inventory of all data elements, all indicators, the way they are calculated, uh, the administrative level for which they are populated, and the frequency of calculating them. So when we achieve system mapping and we have a good understanding of the kind of data and other uh, metadata that exist on both systems, we went ahead to uh, select identification and selection of indicators. Because we know that there are already um, global documents, like some of the one Angela referred to by WHO itself and the US CDC. So we made reference a lot to those guidelines on triangulation and did use some of the examples. That wasn't all. When we had identified a list of good indicators, it was important for us to also you know, ensure it speaks to what um, in-country program officers and Nigeria government likes to uh, monitor and see populated on the triangulation dashboard. So we're able to do prioritization of indicators, analysis and visualization by the national stakeholder. And that, that is also some form of buy-in and approval to proceed. After the indicators have been identified, uh, we proceeded to system development. So we needed to develop the dashboard and I'd like to mention that the uh, current triangulation dashboard we're working on was developed on our, our Shining and um, Kubernetes and Docker technology. So we're working to uh, use all of that infrastructure, which we think is um, easy to build and is sustainable and it's, it's also flexible uh, when we need to interpret with other systems. So talking about the dashboard, using the indicators that have been approved, we're able to create charts, uh, we're able to you know, render them with R, with Python and JavaScript, just so we're able to improve on the user experience and, um, and the look and feel of the dashboard. So these are the methods we had adopted for the development of uh, the triangulation dashboard in Nigeria. Okay, um, so uh, what you see on the screen, uh, the screen, uh, the screen graph for the different, for uh, the dashboard that we're currently developing, and you will see a beautiful visualization, specifically looking at a map that shows uh, vaccination coverage across at the national level and at the sub-national level. And we're able to lay on top of vaccination coverage uh, the number of uh, measles cases. Because we're working with vaccine-preventable diseases, uh, it was important for us to select disease areas that also has uh, corresponding vaccination data. So we've been able to identify measles, yellow fever, and meningitis. And this kind of map is one of its kind in terms of visualization across uh, program area in Nigeria. And it's proven to be, to, to be helpful in the sense that it helps um, stakeholders and decision makers at different levels to be able to see that although there are some areas where we're seeing uh, good vaccination coverage for measles or yellow fever, but we're still seeing a lot of measles cases, a lot of yellow cases in those areas. One of the other things that the dashboard is also promoting it helps us to, you know, finally, it, we're finally able to make use of data from DHS2, from SOMAS and all that surveillance system, which was not there uh, before we started this war, because all, all, all of the systems are, you know, are parallel to each other, controlled by different stakeholders and different um, people, users have access to them. But what this triangulation is doing now is providing access for all healthcare workers, for decision makers at the different, at the national and subnational level. So these are just some of the screen gap. There are other indicators that have been identified. Okay, so these are the some, some, this is a list of some um, indicators that have been identified for visualization. And these are currently populated on, on the dashboard where I shown to you in the previous time. So we have confirmed measles cases versus uh, uh, MCV1 coverages. We have, um, and that data is coming from DHS2 and the summer system. We have age group of confirmed measles cases by vaccination status. This is one very interesting indicator that Osteco that seems to be interested in because it's helping us to see the true picture in terms of um, cases and their vaccination status. And it's helping program um, decision makers at, at, at different level to understand the system better. We also have measles vaccine stock analysis and measles coverage. Uh, we have measles one and measles two dropout rate. Uh, we have discrepancy between MCV1 and yellow fever vaccine doses co administered. Because these vaccines are supposed to be given together at nine months, uh, it was important to 
understand the discrepancy that currently exists between the two of them. So these are just some of the indicators. For all of the indicators here that reflect measles, we have corresponding indicators for yellow fever and for meningitis currently on the dashboard. All right, so uh, in terms of conclusion and next step, uh, what I'm pre we're presenting is a work in progress. And um, the next thing we'd like to do is to complete uh, the integration of that dashboard. So this is not, although I'd said um, DHS2, SOMAS, and other system exist in Nigeria parallel to each other, somebody might be asking, isn't this triangulation also going to be another platform? So we're very deliberate about that. We're not creating another platform. What we're going to do with this dashboard is to make it integrate back onto DHIS2. So all users of DHIS2 will see triangulated data as a dashboard when they log into the system. We are going to also integrate it back into SOMAS so that all the people that have access to that platform right now are able to see that. And other existing um, uh, system in Nigeria, well, so we're not creating a separate link, a separate portal for SK workers to have access to vaccination data, but instead we're going to integrate it back into um, all the existing system. And that's our immediate next step. Discussions are commenced on that and we hope to be able to finalize that soon. Uh, that will be followed by an implementation and, uh, and training of targeted users. I'd mentioned our users at the national level and at the sub-national level. So we're going to plan a robust training on how to navigate the dashboard, how to make the best use of the dashboard because the dashboard will be used there without it being used. So the implementation and training will be will be followed with the mapping and triangulation and integration of other data set. Although we're starting with uh, vaccine preventable diseases, some of them and the routine immunization, there are a whole lot of indicators that stakeholders are beginning to say, we like to triangulate this, we like to see this on the dashboard. So when we're done with that kind of uh, implementation training, we'll start to map and see other data sets that can be triangulated within the primary health care services in Nigeria, and that gets onto the dashboard. And that will be followed by an end user assessment to understand um, accessibility, usability, and how the dashboard that's improved with immunization and vaccine preventable disease uh, uh, data interpretation and use in Nigeria. So this is uh, a brief summary of the routinization and vaccine preventable disease surveillance data triangulation data in Nigeria. Thank you for listening. Stop sharing. All right, hi everyone. Um, my name is Joel Adegoke, and can you hear me? Okay, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so just a, a little disclaimer, obviously I can't take credit for this presentation and the slides, um, these are from our colleagues in Ethiopia, who I'm very sure would have loved to be here today, but uh, couldn't make it. And so I will be speaking to them in terms of sharing the third uh, component. I know Angela mentioned three use cases. We've talked about Côte d'Ivoire, we've looked at Nigeria, and now we also want to look at how Ethiopia was able to use some of the guidance from the data triangulation. And so they focus heavily around um, triangulating between DHIS2 and other data sources, focus more around um, quality and use of uh, immunization data. And so uh, Ethiopia's immunization data comes from DHIS2 and obviously from other sources. So DHIS2 being the more routine system and other sources sort of being the more non-routine system. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. But the country had had some concerns about the quality of the data and the ability to use that data uh, for decision-making and also sort of flagged the need for some critical analysis um, of their data. And so this project was really focused on how to identify uh, issues with the quality of their data, um, identify program performance gaps, and also then use, uh, kind of walk through the process of mapping and triangulation of data um, of those sources to be uh, as, an, uh, as a method of trying to improve uh, the quality of their uh, information. And so this is sort of the approach that Ethiopia had, had used uh, to arrive at that. And so uh, the first step was really a selection of a small group of 
of individuals across the various agencies. And so you have um, um, somewhere selected from the Ministry of Health, so specifically the uh, Directorate of Policy, uh, Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation, and they sort of oversee more of the HMIS um, component. And they also had folks that were selected from the Maternal and uh, Child Health Directorate. So they are the ones that sort of where um, EPI sits. And then you also have um, some um, um, officers that were selected from the Ethiopian Public Health Institute. And they are the ones that sort of oversee more of the surveillance uh, components. And so the first step really was really a training. And again, this happened during COVID. So there was some training that was provided for them um, remotely um, around uh, the change. Sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, so there was some training that was provided um, for these um, select group of officers with, at the national level, um, focused around the basic steps of, uh, of data triangulation. And now once they had completed the training, they now went into a stage of mapping, really trying to map out the various components and variables uh, of data that existed within immunization and not only within surveillance, but also looking at some of those external data sources that are being used uh, for immunization. Uh, they also conducted key performance interviews, um, trying to speak to some of the end users, also program managers around and the, their challenges with the quality of data and with the use of, of, of this data. Then they also conducted some analysis, pretty much you know, looking at trends, frequencies uh, between the HIS2 data and also other, um, some of the other sources. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, then they also try to identify these quality issues and then try to figure out steps on how to promote data use and trying to figure out a way to improve the quality of data but sort of do more data quality checks uh, on a routine basis. And so for the various data sources that they use for this exercise, uh, again, the HMI is the Health Management Information Systems data. Um, they use data from 2000 to 2019. Again, this is data that was pulled from DHIS2. Uh, they also pulled data from the Ethiopia Demographic and Health Survey. Many of us are familiar with this. Um, and I think um, the last presentation from Nigeria um, had highlighted some of the pros and cons of these various data sources. So I wouldn't need to um, uh, touch on that. They also use data from uh, the WUNIC estimates that often released um, annually and a couple of other surveillance and sort of logistics data. And sort of for comparison, they focus more around PENT3, uh, measles 1 coverage, full immunization coverage, and also trying to look at um, issues around outbreak, um, most specifically for, uh, for measles. And most of the analysis was really just comparing um, the data and trends and just line charts um, between these uh, data sources. And I'm gonna look at some examples now. And so I'm going to quickly run through some, you know, charts that um, they had wanted to flag. Um, one of them, as you can see here, was looking at the three coverage, and is looking at data from HMIS, from the EDHS, and also looking at data from uh, from WUNIC. As you can see, um, over time, there are you know significant differences between the HMIS data and the EDHS data. So again. We're looking at routine data versus data that is um, collected through service. And I think many of us are familiar with some of the challenges with these data sources and why sometimes there are you know, obvious differences between them. Um, but the country wanted to flag uh, the significant difference that has been consistent over the years. Um, they also identified that there were small differences between the HMS and WOMIC, and so there was a better correlation. At least uh, the, the data differences were, more, uh, were, were much smaller when looking at HMIS and, uh, and WUNIC. And uh, for this slide, they wanted to flag that, as you can see, that as time went on, uh, the differences, even though you know, there is significant difference between um, HMIS and the survey data, they were able to flag that as time went on, some of that uh, difference sort of had reduced. Again, similar pattern also, if you look at the first dose of measles coverage, again, large gap between HMIS and DHS, and obviously small difference between HMIS and WONIC again, but you can also sort of see the similar pattern also when looking at uh, the first uh, data for, uh, for measles one. Um, and again, as you look at it, um, in terms of looking at the ratio of difference between these two, uh, it was sort of pretty much consistent, more like a 0.5 uh, difference in the ratio over time. 
And they also looked at full immunization coverage, uh, again, looking at HMIs and, D and the, uh, the DHS, again, significant difference over time, um, looking at data for the last 20 years. And when you look at sort of the consistency line, um, looking at the ratio between these two data sources, you can see that although the difference sort of increased around 2011, uh, they sort of observed some kind of decline looking at uh, comparing the uh, both data sources. And so I think sort of the big takeaway here um, is that they also looked at data use. And so when Ethiopia kind of launched the EPI package, there obviously is an EPI dashboard that was attached to that. And it notices that that dashboard was available and being used by the policy planning and monitoring evaluation directorate or more within the HMIS group. Um, so this is the group that, and they observed that that dashboard was being used, but interestingly that there was very you know, limited use within EPI. And again, you expect that for EPI package, EPI units should be sort of at the forefront of it, but they observed limited use of that. Uh, they also observed that there was uh, pretty much no data translation practices. So there was not, uh, there were not standardized um, opportunities for looking at data across multiple uh, data sources. And at the time of this um, exercise, obviously Ethiopia had not, you know, um, started collecting surveillance data on, on DHS2. So some of the big uh, takeaways here, again, issues around completeness of data and inconsistency across data source, which is pretty much um, uh, sort of expected. And I think we've kind of looked at some of those uh, data points. Um, they also observed that there were outbreaks um, in uh, many areas that high had administrative coverage, specifically for, for measles. Um, at a national level, um, they did observe that um, there was uh, the use of DHIS, there was improved or sort of, you know, consistent use of DHIS2 by um, immunization and ME experts. So those within the Ministry of Health, so those within the EPI unit and within the uh, public, um, the policy and planning units had or were more familiar with the use of DHIS2 as compared to those within the surveillance group. Again, this is expected because the surveillance unit obviously had not migrated um, to using DHIS2 for collection of surveillance data. And um, they also observed that, my slide is kind of cut off. Um, uh, I think also that some of the data sources also uh, reviewed that there were other issues again with the quality of data and um, issues also around capacity building. So they observed that, um, you know, those, especially within EPHI, um, did not necessarily have the capacity around um, use of uh, DHIS2. And so, you know, some of the major, you know, next steps and things that Ethiopia had moved on, again, this was done at a national level, super high level. Um, there was a need to obviously do this uh, at a more desegregated level. And so there is a lot of focus around trying to do this at a sub-national level. Um, and also the Ethiopia is trying to build in data triangulation and synthesis of data into its routine activity. So this is not something that should be done one off or once, you know, every you know couple months. Uh, but they're trying to see how this can be done on a more uh, routine basis. And more importantly, sort of training of um, of, of data managers on the use of DHIS2, but also on the use of data translation practices. But I think it extends just beyond data managers, right? You, you know, there's also emphasis on how they can include uh, policymakers and program managers on how to um, use the data or at least interpret some of the results um, from this. So I'm going to pause here and hand over to Angela. She's going to talk about um, some of the examples. Uh, the example of um, data translation dashboard and some of the collaboration we've had with the uh, University of Oslo. Thanks, Joel, um, and thanks to all the presenters. It seems like everyone's quite on time, so I have time to go through some of this, and hopefully um, uh, we can open it up for some questions as well. Um, so the next few slides are really meant to sort of summarize the approaches that countries can take in development of triangulation dashboards, um, especially with what you like have just seen uh, with Uganda, uh, Ethiopia, Nigeria. Um, so we'll kind of go over that and then also sort of how 
how within DHIS2 we can start using some of this as well. Um, so again, just given the data sources that are available within DHIS2, um, the main two topic areas that we're going to focus on, um, though again, triangulation can be many things, it can focus on many topics, um, the two that we'll focus on are around program performance and immunity gaps. Um, so to start with program performance, um, what are the key concepts here that need to be considered when we're talking about a triangulation dashboard? Um, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, uh, but monitoring of course is needed for planning and continuous quality improvement. Um, data quality issues can hide coverage gaps and make finding missed children quite difficult. Um, gaps can be hidden by looking at aggregate data. So if you're looking only at the national or only at one district level, um, or only looking perhaps at a yearly total. Um, so of course, when we dive a bit deeper, substantial variation usually occurs across facilities and uh, districts, um, as well as over months, right? Um, and typically what we find is that when there are reporting errors, oftentimes it's, um, it's really only a few health facilities that are contributing to your data quality issues or data quality issues occurring over just a couple of months. And so if you can really pinpoint um, the, you know, the time and the location in which you're having those data quality issues, um, you can more easily rectify. Um, issues are typically revealed by drilling down by the reporting unit, observing monthly trends, looking at underlying numerator and denominator, and making comparisons with other data. So how can a dashboard really help with program performance? Well, when we're looking at objectives of a uh, program performance dashboard, um, here's just some examples of, of what the, these objectives would be. So allowing staff at the various levels to monitor their own immunization program performance, identify potential data quality issues that need further investigation. A lot of times the dashboard is just gonna give you a sneak peek, right? So it is important to keep expectations um, uh, reasonable in that sometimes you're just gonna notice that there are certain areas that you need to conduct field investigations, root cause analyses, um, go conduct supportive supervision and gather more information. And then also prioritize subnational areas or health facilities uh, for supportive supervision activities. So again, just kind of running through the four-step process when you're thinking about developing the dashboard. Um, what key question are we trying to answer with the program performance dashboard? I think you saw some great examples of this with the Ethiopia um, example. Um, so which districts or facilities have low performance or data quality issues that require follow-up? Um, or does administrative coverage match with other measures of program performance, so comparison to stockouts um, or vaccination session um, or disease burden? So step two, identify existing data sources. Depending on which type of system or uh, software you're using to develop your dashboard, um, you can, like Nigeria did, um, you can integrate a lot of external data sources into one. Um, what we'll be focusing on is what can we actually triangulate within DHIS2 itself. And so we'll see here in the green box, um, there are three data sources within DHIS2 that we can triangulate with. The WHO immunization data package as well as the WHO IDSR aggregate surveillance and the WHO case space surveillance tracker. Um, and so that's really what the prototype that we've been developing um, as CDC as a part of our project with UIO. So step three, summarize the data in the local context. Again, I won't spend too much time on this. You saw some great examples of different analyses that can be included in these triangulation dashboards. Um, but just to go ahead and point out another really great one that's particularly useful at the subnational level um, is looking at an access and utilization grid. Um, so this is looking at Penta 1 coverage um, and the dropout rates from Penta 1 to Penta 3. Um, and in this particular country, then each dot represents a, a different district. And so here you see the grid, there are four different quadrants. So quadrant one, any district that falls within that quadrant, which is the lower right-hand side, they're sort of on track with their program, right? Um, so they have high pentavalent one first dose uh, coverage, and they also have low dropout. Um, so they're vaccinating a lot of kids with first dose, and those kids are coming back. 
Um, for quadrant two, you're kind of seeing that there's some service quality issues here. Um, so they may have high first dose coverage, so kids are coming into the program to get their first dose, but they also have a high dropout rate, so kids are not coming back. In quadrant three, you see that there are access issues. Um, so they have low pentavalent one coverage, so not that many children coming into the facility for the uh, first dose vaccine, um, but those kids are coming back, um, so there's low dropout. And finally, in quadrant four, you see that there's um, both access and service quality issues um, because they have both first dose coverage that's very low um, as well as high dropout. And so as a district health officer um, or, or national level, I would really want to prioritize these places um, that are in quadrant four as sort of highest priority. Um, unfortunately, we didn't have time to have a, a session dedicated to uh, demoing uh, a live demonstration of the DHIS2 triangulation dashboards we've developed, but here's a quick snapshot, um, and perhaps we'll try and uh, send out the link of this um, demo uh, so that way people can, can take a look. Um, but just to say that this, this is in the works, um, and in the last slide, I'll kind of give you an update on that project. Um, and step four, develop an action plan. So with dashboard data, you know, what can you actually do as a next step? Um, well, first, you can identify subnational or areas or health facilities that are in need of supportive supervision, um, or again, like field assessments to better understand what issues are going on. Um, you may want to implement targeted immunization strengthening or data quality improvement activities. Um, you may realize that you need to develop or revise guidance and monitoring processes. Um, integrate data validation checks within your system, uh, perhaps a revised supportive supervision checklists, et cetera. So uh, moving on to the sort of general, generally speaking, how would you, how would countries go about creating um, immunity gaps dashboards? Um, similarly, again, we really saw a great example of this, of, of how Nigeria went about, um, went about creating this type of dashboard. But really the objectives are to allow staff at the various levels to monitor immunity gaps of select vaccine preventable diseases. Um, and the second objective, uh, which has become quite of interest lately, is to identify potential gaps in immunization and or uh, surveillance programs impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so what are some example key questions that you can answer, or at least try to start assessing with a dashboard um, is, uh, does surveillance data suggest there are immunization coverage gaps? If so, what age groups, geographic areas, or high-risk populations? Um, and does our administrative coverage appear to be accurate? Um, so again, not to spend too much time on this, because um, similarly, you're going to be using uh, for a DHIS2 dashboard that we're working on, uh, it's the same three data packages, so the immunization data package as well as the aggregate and case space surveillance tracker. Um, and then just to mention, you know, there are a lot of external data sources here that are not within DHIS2 um, that are particularly helpful in identifying immunity gaps that we hope to consider um, and, and sort of focus on in a phase two of our uh, dashboard prototype. Um, but things like uh, supplementary immunization activities or campaign coverage um, and uh, things of, of that nature, I think also are very important when we're looking at immunity gaps. Um, and I'm just going to briefly, you know, we hear a lot of examples from the national level and maybe a couple of examples from that subnational, like district level. Um, but there's really also a lot that can be done at the health facility level. Um, very, very basic analysis that could be really helpful. I think uh, Patrick gave a very, you know, he gave clear pictures of like the things you see on the walls, right? You'll see the cover, you know, the monthly coverage chart on the wall of the immunization officer at a health facility. Then you go to the surveillance officer his office and you'll see just the total number of vaccine preventable disease cases that are going on um, you know in a given month um, but there's never a place where both of those information are sort of synthesized together um, so an example here is looking at um, first of these is administrative coverage you know on a dashboard right and so in this particular health facility you see over two years you know, they have super super high coverage and in 2019 they're reaching exactly 100 percent coverage um, for both measles first dose and second dose. Um, so as a district health officer, I would be questioning, is this real? Could, this, could there be a data error? Is there fabrication involved? Are we having target population estimate issues? You know, what's going on here? Is this really 100%? 
And so the next thing that I want to see on a dashboard, and, and we really did this um, at a health facility when we were working in Bangladesh, is um, making sure that we're also looking at the cases at the same time. So here is a, a graph of the confirmed measles cases by age and vaccination status. Um, and uh, the demi mentioned again that this graph in particular is super, super helpful in really being able to better identify where you're having your measles cases and, and who is really getting measles um, rather than just looking at that average get total number. And so what you see here is um, in this health facility, you know, generally they do fairly well with, with few cases, um, but there's evidence of delayed vaccination. Um, so here you see between nine months and one year old, um, there, uh, all these cases have had zero doses of measles vaccine. Um, and in this country, according to their vaccination schedule, every child should receive first dose by nine months. So you can see here that this health facility is missing their children. Um, and then similarly, when you're looking at the one to four year olds, um, you see here in orange that there's a many of these kids that only received one dose of measles, but they should have received their second dose of measles by 12 months. Um, and so uh, that also shows you here that um, they're missing children uh, for getting second dose of measles. And so, um, you know, as the district health officer um, uh, was interested in what was going on here, we, you know, we conducted a field investigation and found that the practice here is um, that they're not vaccinating children that are coming in, quote unquote, sick. So low fever, cough, um, anything like that. And those are not contraindications for receiving measles vaccines. So we were able to sort of rectify what that practice was in reality. Um, just to briefly mention again, this is the this is a, a snapshot of the um, triangulation dashboard we have for own the works um, within DHIS2 around immunity gaps. Um, you can see a, a map here that overlays coverage um, and number of cases. Um, and according to Patrick, it sounds like we have to change our color scheme. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, again, and I'll, I won't go over this too much, but you know, it's always okay. So you have your dashboard. Well, what's the action? coming after the dashboard. Um, and so there could be things around strengthening of routine immunization. So for example, on that health facility, um, you know, second year of life platform to make sure you're getting the higher MCV2 coverage. Um, vaccinating specific populations, uh, vaccinating specific age groups. You may realize that you need a national or subnational uh, vaccination campaign, um, or perhaps addressing gaps in surveillance program or surveillance performance um, or immunization data quality. Um, so I'm going to skip that one because we kind of talked about it already. Um, but also, you know, just to summarize, you know, the functional requirements of a triangulation dashboard, you've kind of seen it through all of the use cases and, and what I've mentioned here. Um, but I think number one, you know, incorporating data from multiple sources. Um, what's really key here is the interoperability between routine data sources. Um, and you saw how Nigeria has been able to sort of address that with their DHIS2 system as well as their SHORMA system. Um, and trying to figure out how we can do that better within DHIS2 itself. Um, you also want to be able to have access to this data on DHIS2 um, and make sure that there's consistent update and maintenance of the data. You want to be able to aggregate and disaggregate the data as necessary. So thinking from being able to go from national to district, even health facility level, um, perhaps aggregate to case-based surveillance um, yearly to monthly, um, things like that. And really allowing the users to be able to control this aggregation and disaggregation as they see fit with their data. You want the dashboard to be dynamic. So you want multiple visualizations depending on the type of triangulation. Um, so you saw some great examples here, you know, things that include combination graphs, tables, um, that graph that I showed you that showed the stacked bar charts of uh, the age and vaccination status of cases. That's something that we're having a bit of trouble doing within DHIS2. So we're trying to figure out how we can go about doing that. Um, but just being able to have those different analytical capacities, I think are really important. Um, and you want to allow the dashboards to be customizable to the users, so they can include um, additional triangulation visualizations, they can change their level of aggregation, um, they can change the antigens or vaccine preventable diseases they're looking at, um, or even the time period in which they're trying to analyze.
Um, and additionally, this point's really important and something we're also trying to figure out how to do better within DHS too, is allowing users to make notes or annotations and really interpret, uh, provide interpretations on the analyses. So with that, I'm going to end on this slide here. Um, coming soon, the DHIS2 triangulation dashboard for immunization and BPD surveillance programs. Um, the objectives here are really to streamline the integration of data from the DHIS2 immunization data package, as well as the IDSR and case-based surveillance tracker. Um, and again, just trying to really focus the scope, um, we, we created two dashboards, one sort of more on assessing program performance and one on investigating immunity gaps. We've completed phase one of the project, which is kind of to develop the prototype. Um, so we've created a, a, a um, automated analyses based on the three packages. Um, and then phase two will be to hopefully pilot this um, in a country that is actually implementing all three of these data packages. So it'll likely be an Afro country that we pilot um, to assess the dashboard functionality and adaptability and use. Um, and then also sort of focusing a bit more on the interoperability uh, with external data sources as well. Um, so with that, I'll just say we have lots and lots of great resources around this. I'm sorry we didn't have more time to, to dive in a bit deeper, um, but uh, these slides will be available so uh, you can uh, access any of these links. Um, and just want to say uh, thank you very, very much. Um, and please feel free to reach out to Joel or I via email. Um, we'll put it in the community chat um, if people have additional questions. But I think we actually have time for some questions now um, before we maybe adjourn around 11.50, 11.55, so people can head over to the other side. It's the last session of the day, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> Um, and please feel free to put questions in the community groups and those things. We can also um, just continue the conversation uh, post-conference as people digest everything they've talked about over the past few days. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, thank you very much. Fantastic presentations and uh, really very encouraging to see this, uh, uh, I don't want to call it pivot, but this progression from single source data to multi-source multi data. It's fantastic especially in the HIV space, this is something that we've been asking because uh, as we get, uh, the countries get closer and closer to epidemic control, uh, the problems are now around individuals, not around groups. But I would like to make two comments in here. One is in terms of the, the different source of data, I think we need to start sort of looking beyond health data into whether into political, the economic, and other sources because they all have impact on how we provide treatment and how we care about individuals. And the second important thing is, I think the focus should not be on uh, program performance alone, which we've been doing for many years. I think the focus, especially in the HIV AIDS space, is about patient care. Uh, when I say patient care, we really want to know why are people interrupting their treatment? How can we bring, we can bring people back into treatment? How do we manage those to follow up? And this kind of things require actually uh, not only aggregate or public you know, data, we also uh, uh, need to get patient level data. Uh, and how do we connect, for example, the aggregates, the bigger into the patient level data? How do we connect into AMRs? I know there was discussion yesterday about AMRs, but I think uh, the focus should be kind of a little bit away from program performance, more into patient care, and then also bring in other patient-related data. Otherwise, I think it's very encouraging and fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, two great points um, and agree with you completely. Um, and just to briefly mention, uh, we have been working a bit uh, with global colleagues as well as our own CDC colleagues around, uh, at least in the vaccination and immunization program worlds, uh, like vaccine demand and making sure we're sort of understanding the issues around patient care and people being hesitant to get vaccines. What are those reasons? Or patients maybe being hesitant to come back after a bad experience um, and trying to figure out how we can better triangulate uh, that that sort of information to, to pinpoint some of those as well.
any other questions or comments? Um, oh. <clears throat> thank you very much for the uh, presentation. Um, it was quite an eye, eye opener. Um, I have actually noticed that uh, many times when we uh, develop our dashboards in most of our implementations, uh, aspects of uh, data quality are rarely, you know, looked at. So you can imagine a top management person who then, you know, we have those um, relative dashboards where the time will just move um, as, you know, the days progress and the likes. In the times you'll be focusing on some kind of trends and the likes. And in the process at times, you know, you also um, get to uh, identify, maybe see some data quality issues, probably just as an outlier, for example. And uh, probably this is probably another way of trying to identify some of those uh, outliers. Probably my question is um, how best can we then address, you know, some of those data quality issues um, as we present um, the dashboards rather than waiting to go back to the source and then doing the adjustment, which might, which might actually take time and at times may not necessarily be feasible many times, at least so that, you know, the decision maker, in as much as the data may not, may not be necessarily correct, it is at least close to reality. Instead of just probably just identifying the error, what else can we do to probably say adjust the, the, the error? Thank you. Um, I would let other colleagues also um, give their input uh, from countries, but just to say, I think um, that's where capacity building at the different levels really comes in. I think it's quite important. I mean, of course, depending on the country, some countries, you know, their data entry occurs at district level versus some countries, their data entry does occur at the health facility level. Um, but really making sure that at each of those levels that they um, have the knowledge and the power to be able to understand their own data Data, you know, their own data entry and reporting and be able to look at their own data quality. Um, so that way it can quickly sort of rectify at the appropriate level rather than having to wait until, you know, the district health officer looks at all of the health facilities and finally gets to every single health facility. Um, so I would say that's kind of one of the biggest challenges. And I think it was mentioned um, by all of the presenters that the capacity building and training piece is just so, so important. I think because of your exact point that um, Really being able to quickly rectify a lot of these issues. Um, when we were uh, developing the guidance and, and piloting this uh, in Bangladesh, you know, we uh, we were able to find, you know, it, you know, a health facility that was kind of consistently an outlier, and they were sort of there was clearly a, a consistent data entry issue, um, and so it was kind of just a matter of calling them up and being like, hey, like, can you double check data from you know X month to Y month, um, and they were able to sort of quickly rectify it over um, uh, over their DHIS2 system because they do enter a data at the health facility level. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. That's sort of my thought, um, but I don't know if others have any other comments. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, how well are our triangulation data, uh, uh, I can say, accurate in comparing uh, performance and coverage um, with um, uh, drug stock use? Uh, because this is something uh, we're trying to look into, but sometimes it can be tricky regarding the drugs uh, part. So how? Well, are we uh, good in comparing the coverages with the drug trends when we don't have um, shortages and so on? Um, good question. It looks like Joel maybe wants to have a comment, um, but just while he's coming up, um, you know, at least in talking about vaccine stock, one of the things that we also look at are wastage rates. And so um, one thing that's incorporated onto the DHIS2 triangulation dashboard is kind of creating a heat, uh, like a heat map chart of all of the health facilities or districts um, and their wastage rates and kind of flagging, you know, which ones have extremely oddly low wastage rates, um, even negative wastage 
wastage rates. Restaurants have super, super high wastage rates. And, and in the vaccine world, high vaccine wastage isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, there could be open dose vial policies where you know the country says you can open one vial of vaccine to vaccinate one child. And if you waste the rest, that's okay. Um, but it does kind of flag just sort of where we have any data quality issues. And then compares, comparing that uh, with different coverage kind of gives us a bit of an idea of, you know, are we actually vaccinating the number of children that we're saying we're vaccinating based on that stock data? Um, so that's just one quick example I'll let Joel um, also add. Yeah, thanks. I was going to say pretty much similar things. I was, one thing I was going to add is that yeah, probably not the only one interested in looking at like stock data and also like vaccine utilization data with with that. Uh, so, for example, in the Nigerian use case when they had created like the first draft of the translation data, just looking at just immunization and uh, VPDs, uh, there was a request from the the team that manages sort of like vaccine utilization and stock data uh, for that to be included as part of like the third data source. And so there is a lot of interest especially from those that you know, manage more of the logistics components to ensure that their own data is included. And I think that hopefully we will start seeing more um, examples of, of countries, including logistics data uh, into that process. So yeah. Yeah, thanks Joel. Do you, Patrick, do you have a comment? I think uh, maybe come, come up here for the mic. No, no. Mine is just um, a quick one of, uh, on how we can maybe be better coordinated while we are trying to implement these dashboards because um, in country it can be confusion, you know. Uh, while we are doing the immunization uh, package dashboard for Uganda, I was at a pulpit preaching the gospel of DHIS2 and how it can do everything. Then all of a sudden, if another, other colleagues show up, they also have dashboards. And this one they're using are shiny. And of course, they're trying to pull data from DHIS to into another platform and trying to do so a bit of confusion, especially for the users. So I don't know how we can be better coordinated, but maybe a bit organized. And I liked the, the idea of so if you are doing maybe dashboards outside DHIS, then try and make some of them go in so that uh, for a user, it's not I can use this without necessarily going the other side. So I think that that's really important for us to uh, to think about and to properly implement. Quick comment to that. Thank you so much, Patrick. I think that um, because of the way the dashboards are, um, you know, we have to be extremely careful that we are not, like you said, confusing the users. And I think that hopefully Nigeria becomes one of those examples that is able to integrate this dashboard back. So I think one of the things that they did was they ensure that during this whole process, they work with like the technical working group at the national level to be say, hey, this is what we're trying to do. This is the plan. And so whatever is built outside of DHIS2, because it's pulling data from multiple information systems, is then integrated back on DHIS2 as a third party tool. And so that at the end of the day, users can access that data. And in some cases, they want it temporary, in some cases they want it permanent. But I think ensuring that all the various stakeholders are at the table and I agree and ensure that there is proper coordination is important, but I'm a huge advocate of ensuring that whatever is built outside is integrated. And I think it's good that DHIS2 has um, that functionality to incorporate those um, external tools um, in it. So very great comments. So. Thank you very much, everyone. I'll, I will give another round of applause because it was like, last session of the week and on top incredibly interesting session so yeah thank you very much everyone for being here thank you for the people online and uh, you may go in peace